Hello and welcome to the Laser Sports Academy podcast. You're here with Ben Baker, also known as Butzer, and I'm here today with co-founder of the Laser Sports Academy, Ryan Holmes, also known as Holmes. How are you going, Ryan? Yeah, pretty good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Thanks for joining us. And our guest today, Mr. Michael Madcans Pastorello, captain of the Spartans and member of the Zeltac uh, Organisational Committee. Thank you so much for coming on today, Cairns. No, no worries, Butch. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, yeah, uh, here we are. Um, the purpose of today is to have a chat about team caps. And, um, yeah, it's the current hot topic, I guess. So, so one of the things we, we really want to do here on the Laser Sports Academy is just have really um, good productive discussions about things that are up for our community um, and invite questions from our community as well. So uh, we're really stoked that... Um, Cairns, uh, you know, accepted our invitation to come on today to talk about this because uh, it's, yeah, there's a lot. It's, um, I guess, over the last few years, we've put this system in play. We haven't had maybe potentially the full chance to see it in action yet. And what's looking to happen is that that, that chance might come up very shortly. So, um, yeah, there's certainly some things on the cards there coming up in the future. So, um, just before we start, fully aware we have two uh, Zeltac committee members on the on the on the chat today. So uh, nothing we <laughs> say here today is uh, on behalf of Zeltac. Uh, this is just a bunch, uh, three guys having a chat about stuff. And um, yeah, there's obviously a, a whole bunch of discussion happening about team caps, um, as we all know, because um, Zeltac have been in contact with 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 the players, uh, asking questions so that they can do an inf make an informed decision on things. So, uh, yeah, we won't be discussing anything about the future today. We're just going to be talking about how we got to the current system or how the current current system works, essentially. So having said that, um, yeah, uh, Cairns, I thought a good place to start would be to talk about the, the last few years because it had an interesting start. We started, or well, you, you, you were, took, had a massive part in... Uh, creating this um these regulations these team cap regulations so yeah when did all the discussions start and how did the first few years progress yeah so actually like before this podcast i went over my original kind of proposal for this i nearly had like vietnam flashbacks <laughs> to what was going on back then um yeah so like people in our community really really like playing laser tag and get very, very passionate when you tell them they might not be able to. So like, it was a very difficult time. And we're tired of talking 2018 Aubrey. And that was the first time, I think we had so many teams, I think it was 35 or 36, that we actually had to change the comp to accommodate the teams. So because we had so much scheduling problems, we had to do a partial round robin and we had to do um, a adjusted final series. So it wasn't a full format D, the original suggestion was essentially that we were just going to cut it hard at 15 and 15 started finals. And then people were unhappy with that. And then we did a like one game elimination to 15 and then a format D. So the 2018 was the first time we had to adjust the comp because we had too many players or too many teams at the competition. And that kind of spurred the conversation around what do we do? Because people want to play a full round robber and they want to play everybody, or at least back then they did. Um, and people wanted to do the full format D. Um, so it was like, well, how do we decide who gets to go and who doesn't get to go and what's the cap and what's the number? And all those questions started to flood through um, and everybody had an answer and they weren't all good answers and everybody was very passionate about their answer. Um, and from the, the two main arguments that came up were we do a team cap based on state allocation. So every state or every region gets allocated a certain amount of spots and they can use those spots however they want and then that comes in under cap. And then the second argument was we do a performance-based cap where based on previous performance, whether it's past nationals or pre-nats or sort of whatever you want to go off, we allocate spots based on performance. And essentially what happened is people got very polarized where it was you're on one side or you're on the other. So it was either your full state-based allocation or your full performance-based sort of allocation. Um, and yeah, it got very passionate. It got very heated. There are a lot of sort of different opinions as what should happen. So um as we're coming into 2019, the committee that I was on at the time took uh, ideas for proposals for team caps, where we said, you know, if you have any ideas or you have any ideas of what you think the team cap should look like, submit your proposal and we will sort of 
work on what we think is the best one and find a way to adapt that to something that could be working in the future. Um, I did submit a proposal and the kind of the whole crux of my proposal was the idea that you can't have one or the other. It has to be a combination of both where you do need some base rate based allocation of spots, but you also need some performance based allocation of spots. And if you just do one, what happens is the weakness of each of those systems gets highlighted a lot more. So if you just did solely state based allocations, there'd be a lot of good teams that don't get to go to the result act. And if you did solely performance based allocations, there'd be some states that just never got a chance to go at all. So when you do just one or just the other, the weaknesses become a lot more prominent. So the idea was to find a balance that we could do both and have some flexibility and highlight the strengths of those systems without having the weaknesses as much. Um, and I think my original proposal, the balance was we had every region, so if you include the seven states of Australia, um, the two territories and New Zealand, that's nine regions, they all got allocated two. So they just get those two. That's the state-based allocation and that comes to 18. Um, and then and there was, I think, 12 for the performance-based spots. And then there was a host site got an extra one. And then there was like two spots for the committee or for internationals to come in on. So the balance ended up being, it was 64% of the spots were allocated um, and 36% of them were uh, performance-based. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea of how we could keep the balance of all of these things sort of going together. And I think essentially what we came to realize was, you know, people come to nationals for a lot of different reasons where, you know, some people like the social aspect, some people like the competitive aspect, some people like the sort of everybody from every state gets to be there. Um, and all of those things are important in their own way. And instead of thinking of it like it's this or it's that, it's this is a real fragile ecosystem. And as soon as you start sort of fucking with it, it gets problematic. So you've got to be able to balance it and any sudden changes or taking one thing out and everything seems to collapse on it in on itself. Um, the other thing we did with the team caps is we had a transition year before we employed it. So we didn't start at the next year in 2019. What we did was that was a holdover year where everyone still got to submit as many teams as they had in the previous year. And then Darwin 2020 was the first year the team caps took effect. Mm. Um, some other things is we, we reduced it to 33 teams because that's kind of the magic number for getting through a full round robin, getting through a full format D, getting through two cascades within the context of the time that we had. Mm. Um, as for what actually happened, um, so team caps are in play in Darwin. We didn't reach cap for Darwin, so nobody actually didn't get to go because of it. Um, and then we had a two and a half year hiatus for Bendigo because of COVID. And then we didn't enforce any of the team caps because we were low on numbers for Bendigo. And that sort of brings us to where we are today. Mm. So that's I know, probably a bit long winded there, but that's kind of the history of how we got where we are. <laughs> no, that's a really great um, summary. And like, I really appreciate what you said about how, um, how, how much it meant to people because the whole thing about nationals that I can remember going back mm -hmm. to the early days is it's it, the premise of it is that anybody can go. It's an all-inclusive event. And suddenly we get to a point where we have no choice but to say some people can go and some people can't go. And it gets to the fabric of what the tournament's all about because part of the, one of the, I think the core values of the whole community is how accepting we are of of new new people, new players. We're always, you know, trying to get new scenes started, that kind of a thing. So uh, I can uh, fully understand why people had passionate, um, you know, positions in, in one side or the other. And um, mm -hmm. there was, there's a question I want to ask you. I might bring it forward, actually, because it kind of, I think it fits in here. If um, I wanted to ask you about if the balance, if we go out of balance in any way, if we go one way or the other, what, what do you think could happen to the tournament, to Zeltac, if we, say, become too performance oriented or we go the opposite and become too, you know, regional oriented and just allocate all the positions based on Yeah, region? so it's that if we just went full performance, we risk scenes dying in some of the smaller states because they just might have a year where they're not represented um, and that could flow on to another year. So we might, you know, Canberra might not send anybody or hit any of the performance marks and then they just don't go, mm. right? And that's problematic because we're now not encompassing as much as we want to mm. as a tournament. Um, and going the other way is part of the tournament is having the best players play against each other and getting to play against the best players. So we went purely state-based allocation is there's a chance that there might be like a really good Queensland team that doesn't get to go simply because there's just not enough spots to go around for that one state if we're giving every state like three spots. Mm. Yeah, and I guess there's so a there's a risk the... there of um I can see it happening with the performance if it was purely performance based, there's a risk of like almost 
uh, snowballing in a way where you have the same state just being able to send teams. And um, in my experience, it's always felt like teams have made the biggest leaps and bounds over the course of a tournament. Like obviously we all train year round, but there's a lot of, um, especially like for newer teams, they make so many massive advancements in their games from being able to go to nationals. And then if you, uh, you know, the, a, a state's not allowed to play at nationals because it's purely performance based, then they're going to really struggle to get into a position where they're ever going to be able to, to really send a, like a meaningful amount of teams. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, you know, it, you, you see it time and time again with anything that's particularly polarizing where there's lots of people in one camp, lots of people in another camp. Most of the time, the best thing to be doing is some kind of a compromise between the two. So um, and that sounds, yeah, that's exactly what you've done. So yeah. your system. And it sounds like um, the dance is the compromise is like, uh there's this fine line where things are kind of in balance and if um at like a small change in the regulations could slightly tilt the balance one way or the other so fully recognize how difficult uh that must be for the committee um and yeah you know really looking at uh it's, it's an ecosystem right it's an ecosystem as soon as you introduce something else it's gone yeah yeah, so everything, it's just like introducing like cane toads, right? Like it's, surely it's just going to solve the problem and everything, nothing else will be affected. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. You heard it here first, people, but comparing <laughs> all of us to cane toads. <laughs> nice. Not at all, not at all. That's, that's the way I it's took it at least. It's showing that you could change, try to attempt to change one thing, but it's rarely, rarely the case. It's, it all changes uh, everything in the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the performance based allocations. Uh, so we know from the current system, mm -hmm. the top three get a spot. So the, top, the finalists essentially get a spot each, uh, and then from four to six, yeah, they get a spot for their state, they get a stop, spot for their state. Uh, and then from four to 16, there's mm -hmm. 11 spots allocated or sorry, eight spots, eight spots. Because there's yes. 11, 11 performance states, uh, performance slots in total. Um, three of them are the finalists, so there's eight left. So can you explain a little bit about how that works? Because when I was reading through it, I was, um, my brain was getting tied in knots trying to figure out exactly how it works. But eight slots will be allocated to states for teams ranked 4 yeah. to 16. Preference will go to the highest ranked team from each state in descending order. So yeah, how does that work? Yeah, so, um, and look, I think th that one you're reading from is the original 2019 one. I do think the Bendigo one, there was 12 spots for performance. Um, so there is some variation here. Mm. Um, so the way that's meant to work is essentially is the top three teams in the grand final get a spot for their state. And then it goes down kind of in descending order. The team that got fourth then gets another spot for their state. And then it goes, if like um, Adelaide had fourth and fifth, it would bypass fifth. Uh, the next non-Adelaide team to give a performance spot to. And then it would go all the way down the list and then go back up to the next round. So that Adelaide fifth team would then earn one in the next round for it, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. And what was... So yeah. it goes through... <laughs> so this was not in my original proposal. I think my original proposal, I did actually just want it to go straight down, but it was one of the things that the committee decided on at the time was this kind of process of... It has some state base to it. So if you get more teams into the um, top area, you're not necessarily advantage. It sort of goes through that if you get that sort of team in. So it'll go uh, at a South Australian team, a Queensland team, a New South Wales team, and go all the way down to 16, and then it'll go back up for the second round. It'll right. bypass any states that have sort of teams in doubles, if that makes sense. Righty ho. Okay. So, right. Yeah. That was the bit that always got my brain. It was like, oh, okay. That's interesting. Trying to, trying to wrap my brain around that one. Um, so it's kind of a, disadvantage to have two spots in a row on the ladder would you say no like having them higher up still gives you an advantage because you get the next round mm. it just kind of um makes it a little less it makes the performance pathway slightly less brutal yeah. than what it you when it would be if we just went straight down um and as i said like when so when i gave in my proposal it went through a lot of hands and there was a lot of things that we had to sort of do to get it agreed upon and this was one of those compromises we had to make to the system mm -hmm. okie dokie Cool. Um, it should also be said, another thing that we did add was we did, we did cap performance-based spots. So there is a maximum amount of spots you can earn from performance. Mm. 
So you can only get three performance spots. So you, that caps you out of, like, if you have three teams in the final, then it doesn't matter how many teams you have in the top 12, you're not getting another spot. Does that mean the max is five? Max is five if you don't include host site, which gives oh. you another one. So you could get, if you had five and a host site, it could be six, and that's the max. Cool. I know we can't talk about it now, but I can't wait to hear, like, w w if we do go to 37, I know that's on the cards, um, you know, where that where those spots get allocated will be really, really interesting. I'm sure that's a hot topic of discussion. Anybody who wants to come and discuss it with us next week, feel free. Mm. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask Cairns what, uh, what, um, what you feel has worked and what hasn't worked so far in the in the current system? It's far from perfect, but I think one of the underrated things about the system is how it manages expectations. And I think this is kind of putting that in this two-year cycle with nationals. So nobody should ever be blindsided by the team caps. You should never go, oh, I didn't expect those allocations or I didn't expect the number of spots we got. Mm. There are clear, precise pathways to this is how you get what you get, right? Um, so everyone goes into nationals with their expectations managed of this is what we have to do. And there's no kind of retrospectively going back to the tournament. We don't go back to Darwin <clears> and go, well, we're going to change our spots now, right? We're only going to give away this many performance spots and this many allocated spots. It's the, we don't go backwards in time, we go forwards and there's always this two year cycle. So everyone's expectations is managed. Everyone kind of knows what to expect and everybody can plan and organize teams around what, that, what that, that's kind of going on. And I think that that's probably one of the strengths in the system where Previously to the system, nationals was just like, it, each nationals was its own kind of individual thing mm. and there was no kind of flow on. Mm. So committees would be making decisions as they came in, affecting the next nationals or based off the nationals that just happened. And it was kind of, it was chaos. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That continuation is so key, isn't it? To, um, especially like the decisions being made now are so impactful. Um, yeah, we've gotten to that point now where all, all, all the all the things that are like on the plate of the committee are like significant decisions for the future of the, the tournament and the game. So, yeah, that continuation is um, so important for that. Um, I know at one stage the um, the Zeltac were approving um, the state based um, sort of selection methods. Can you share a little bit about how that all happened and uh, what, what they were taking into consideration when approving the systems? Yeah, so um, probably another thing that people are unaware of with the team caps was there was this big shift when we're going to state-based sort of allocations and only having a certain amount of teams per state is that somebody had to make the decision of who got to go and who didn't go. And that wasn't a decision for Zeltac to make. Zeltac kind of had to put that power into somewhere else and a lot of the state-based associations that power was put onto. So previously to team caps and I think going back like further into like the history of zone is, you know, you'd get your side operator to sign off on you and that was all you needed to go to nationals. Um, so the team cap actually puts a lot of empowerment into the players where player run associations now have a lot more agency and autonomy and responsibility and power to a say who's going to Nats from their state mm. and how we're going to get there, right? Um, so Zeltac wanted that to happen because that player empowerment is actually a really important part of building zone communities. Um, we also wanted to make sure that there was some, um, I'm thinking what's the word here, oversight on that so that you couldn't just have one person, you know, saying this is what's going to happen or there wasn't any abuse of power. So a lot of the processes that the state-based associations used to decide who's going get approved by Zeltac. And when I say approved by Zeltac, Zeltac really what we're looking for is to make sure there is some type of um, democracy process in there, that it's not just one person and it is giving some, you know, everyone a fair chance, regardless of what the players have decided. What we really want is we want the players to have decided what system they want to use and that there is some democracy in that. And when you do that, it doesn't matter what system, we don't care what system, it's more that everybody's involved and has some in inclusion in that and empowerment in that as well. Mm. Um, and changing, if the if a state decides to change or refine their system, it's just a simple like run it past the committee and um, the committee just sort of ch continues to check for that, um, you know, the objectivity or the fact, you know, that same, cri those same criteria that you just described essentially. And yeah, um, it'd be interesting to see if- Yeah, like people are, have the right to change, that's fine. Yeah. 
Ryan, how did you guys go about your um, state-based selections? Um, yeah, so I think <clears throat> we were all unanimously, unanimously pretty keen on the idea of uh, for teams to qualify for Nats. It was hosting like our own like state-based competitions. Um, so in a way, you know, it's kind of like a performance-based selection like in the state as well. Um, but it kind of just made the most sense, you know, we want the most, like we want the best teams we've got to be going to nationals to increase the chances of us getting more team slots in the future. Um, we used to have a clause where, um, cause at this point we only really had the one team that was ever getting close to earning that team slot for us, which was apex. Um, we had a, we had a phase where, um, cause through, a uh, uh, because uh, they earned the slot for us, we were going to say we had a clause in there where if a team sticks together with like you know it's m a very large percentage of the team is still together, they get the slot that they earned from nationals because they're pretty likely to earn it again. Um, we initially had that, um, but we've since gotten rid of it because now like the scenes kind of leveled out quite a bit. Um, you know, it's it's a lot more competitive than it used to be. Um, but yeah, we. We have our team selection competitions and we, we do like, I think last time we did four, but I think we were thinking about just doing three this time around. Um, just to make sure, you know, obviously we all play laser tag. Sometimes you just have a bad night and you ha hate to have your, um, whether you get to go to nationals or not, which is the thing that for a lot of people, it's like their favorite time of the year. It's the thing they work towards and look forward to all the time. Um, you'd hate to have that determined on like one night where you just didn't have a good night. Um, mm -hmm. so that's why we do it across three, um, three, three, three qualifiers. And we actually had a waiting system where like, um, the earlier qualifiers were worth less than the later ones. Cause the idea was to, um, reward the teams that are like, you know, if you didn't do so well on the first one, but then you are getting better throughout the the year it's like generally like a good indication um so yeah last time we did have like a, a, a waiting on the you know it wasn't just a flat like average score or average comp points across the the top the the, the state-based competitions we came up with our own separate point system which was weighted more heavily towards like the later qualifiers um yes but on top of that we also have a um individual qualifier process um, the previous one was just something like we were recorded attendance and you had to attend like X amount of like a certain percentage of trainings and you had to do like a season of league or something to make sure you're actually like around and playing and stuff. Um, we are moving to a community point space system now, which effectively achieves the same thing, but just to give more people like give having multiple things that give you points rather than just like you have to attend lots of trainings or league because obviously some people work and stuff um you know it is what it is but the idea behind that was um we didn't want you know some of the older more veteran players relative to our newer players to get away with being able to just go to nationals without training at all just by virtue of like they're a lot more experienced like in in our minds it was a case of if we were to choose between a team of like a, a development team that are like coming to training every single week and they're, you know, they're playing at leagues and they're trying to help out the new guys versus um, a team of players where none of them train ever. They only go to the qualifier comps or, and they don't really engage with the scene. It was a case of, we felt like that development team deserves that slot more than the, um, you know, the team that's just better just by virtue of like they've played for longer um so that was that was uh the idea behind having an individual uh qualification process on top of a team qualification process i guess that's a really good point is that you could use the um the, the, the use it as an opportunity to just like craft some really good habits and cultures within your community like you know requiring the minimal amount of training to happen to be able to qualify for nats and that kind of a thing suddenly you know that's can shift behavior and that's you know, when you're a figurehead in the community, that's what you're trying to do. Hey, you're trying to like get, you know, get dedication from your players, come to training, um, you know, come to the comps, uh, you know, behave well, all that kind of thing. So, um, 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Cairns. I'm, I'm not completely over the system that we used last time in Queensland, but it was more of a points-based system, wasn't it, to um, select our players for Darwin, I think it was? Uh, that we had um, a selection comp for Darwin, but I think we only had um, five teams anyway, so it didn't matter. Yeah, okay. Then uh, my team came in under the... So we, we had organised... Your team came in under the committee mm. spot, yeah. Yeah. So we've ha- we haven't actually had to exercise anything. So yeah, Queensland in, in the yet. past has done. Um, so we've done selection comps, but we've never had to actually eliminate a team. Um, and I think we've recently changed to a selection panel mm. that will form teams as well or approve teams as we go through. Yeah. And that was to try and address what you were talking about earlier, Ryan, about, um, you know, you can have a bad night. Uh, yeah. So yeah, presumably a selection panel, if you've got the right people, um, you can... Um, you take take into account all the all the all the parameters that need to be. Um, so, we'll yeah, see how aftershock it goes. aftershock actually came third in one of our qualifier comps. So, if, <laughs> if that was what decided us going to nationals, that would have been very upsetting. Well, you've got we had a really spots, bad so. night. <laughs> it's also it's also really hard when you've got to eliminate one team. Like if you're running a comp and you had like 15 teams and top five go through, that's fine. But when you're running a comp and there's five teams that go through and one doesn't, there's a lot of shenanigans that can happen just with, you know, tactics in a three-team game that where sometimes ne- not necessarily the best team goes. Yeah. And the other problem that Queensland have is when you're running across two different sites, there's a big significant difference in home maze advantage, mm. particularly in the younger players. So you have to run it across both stuff and then there's friends in, on different teams and it becomes a bit messy as well. Cool. So final question for you, my friend, Michael Madcans Pastorello. Um, what, if the Nats continues to grow like like we've seen, what do you see the role for the state-based comps being? Do you see, is there going to be a, a transition in the way we look at Zeltac and we look at um, state-based comps? Yeah, I think 100%. I think that Zeltac used to be the way in which you, Zeltac used to be the process. It used to be how you develop players and got players to like laser tag as you took them to Zeltac. Where Zeltac is now shifting to becoming the outcome, mm. where you need to go through the process to get there mm. and you kind of have to earn your way in, which is good. But it does mean that a lot of these state based competitions like pre Nats, like Queensland Rumble, like the Albury comps and the Bendigo comps have to be this way in which we introduce people to laser tag and we start to develop and get them into that process and get them into the community and the scene. Um, so we need more of them and we need to kind of, you know, put more importance of getting new players there as we go through. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Mr. Ryan Holmes, any final comments before we, we finish up? Yeah. Just on the topic of, um, how I see state-based comps evolving in the future. Um, if you look at any established sport or like, if you like follow esports at all, they usually have some kind of, um, a, you know, there's the, that the top A league that everyone's striving to get to. Um, and then there's usually like a sub level of competition below that, that still get like, gets quite a lot of viewership and it's like kind of the proving grounds for a lot of players um, to then get picked up by organizations and teams. Um, and I think, yeah, like Mad Cans was kind of saying previously, we haven't really had that level to separate Zoltak from just a player that's playing league and training locally. You know what I mean? It's just like playing league, training locally. All right, we're going to take you to your first nationals. And then that's like, yeah, like you were saying, it's like the process of getting people involved and getting them good. Whereas I really actually, I, what I, what I would hope to see in the next few years is potentially, um, the state-based competitions actually getting like, like being live streamed and stuff and getting a bit of viewership and potentially like commentating it to the same sort of level that we commentate our Zoltac thing. Um, and I think it's just a, yeah, just putting that step between, you know, just playing locally and training locally to go into nationals, but it, there's, there's a, there's an opportunity to like broadcast it and stuff. And, you know, you can, everyone likes watching laser tag and enjoys laser tag. So I think at the end of the day, more people making more laser tag content is um, a good thing. Um, and, you know, you can do a little bit of snooping, a little bit of homework, you know, you can, you know, we're coming up against the Queensland guys. Let's watch some of their state-based competition games and see how they like to go. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I don't know. I just think it'd be really cool. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we've seen the skill gap close so fast with the stream already. Imagine if it goes to a state level. Like, suddenly that's going to take it to a whole whole nother level of a, of acceleration. Mm. Um, awesome. Yeah, so, so, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Cairns, for coming on the chat today. Really appreciate you coming and sharing a bit of the history. Um, we hope this has been of use to, uh, like, just, you know, you know, have, uh, you know, piqued your curiosities and answered some questions for you. And we invite anybody uh, with questions or who would like to have, you know, further discussions on the topics that we discussed tonight to please send them through to us. Uh, we're happy to discuss these things in future podcasts. Anybody who wants to jump on and share some uh, views, opinions, uh, and um, maybe some ideas that they have, we totally welcome it. So, uh, yeah, once again, thanks, Mayor Cairns. Thanks, Holmes. And we hope to see you again next time.